So uh, I guess we've all been there, uh, spent a night on the plane crossing the Atlantic. Um, you're uh, tired and in something of a fog and the, uh, I believe they're, they're known as border force now. The border force agent asks you what you're doing in London and you tell him you're speaking at a conference and he says, oh, about what? So you come up with the shortest version you can think of, which, so in my case, I said the history of archaeology. And he said, what about it? Something wrong with it? So clearly the publicity for this conference has spread far and wide. <laughs> All right, well, with the, 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 the impending fire alarm, I better get to it. So two incidents, two short stories, if you will, encapsulate the history I want to tell this morning. In May 1881, just a week after the signing of the Bardo Treaty, establishing a French protectorate over Tunisia, René Cagnat, a young classicist sent by the French government to survey the archaeological terrain in Tunisia, sent a letter to an official of the Ministry of Education in Paris. Begun in late January, Kanya's mission had not gone well, hampered by an uncertain military situation that forced an abrupt return to Tunis in April and then a retreat to Algeria. In his letter of 21 May, Kanya explained why he had not yet set sail for France as planned. An opportunity had come up to visit the Tunisian coastal town of Tabarka near the Algerian border. He wrote, quote, before leaving Algeria, I found a favorable opportunity to retake scientific possession of Tunisia, and I did not want to let it slip." Unquote. Now on his way back to France, he promised a re verbal report on his visit, which he described as très pénible, a frequently used French word that can describe anything from back pain to an unusually long faculty meeting. Almost half a century later, in July 1925, an American travel and expedition manager based in Paris, Edward Stover, wrote a letter to Francis Kelsey, a classicist and founder of the archaeology program at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, whose archaeology museum bears his name to this day. Stover had just had a visit from the Abbé Chabot, a French archaeologist and a member of the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, the governing body and main funder of French archaeology, with whom he and Kelsey had been excavating at Carthage just north of Tunis. From what he said, Stover recounted, quote, our friend in Tunis is so well protected by someone in authority that he is difficult to dislodge, and the abbé seems to think that under the circumstances, Poinceau will refuse authorization to send the 500 urns which you have requested. The person referred to, Louis Poinceau, was the director of the Tunisian Antiquities Service, and Chabot's information was quite accurate. A quarrelsome man, highly sensitive to any breaches of rules or agreements, Poinceau had obstructed many archaeologists seeking to work in Tunisia. The name of his protector was René Cagnat. You may find here the outlines of a familiar story, the imperial power claiming possession in the name of science, then some decades later, jealously defending its prerogatives and its property against those of a rival. Heritage and nationalism, you may be thinking. Where have we heard this story before? Where have we not? Certainly these two moments frame the emergence of archaeology in Tunisia as a field organized within a network of institutions at once scientific and colonial. But the politics of archaeology do not simply replicate on a smaller scale those complex, dynamic, and shifting as they are of colonial systems writ large nor do they pertain only to the spaces of intersection between colonialism and the knowledges it both generates and relies on. Bruno Latour defines a network as a concentration of resources in nodes and knots connected through lines and mesh. Quote, these connections transform the scattered resources into a net that may seem to extend everywhere, unquote. Let us take Latour's may seem, to which I will return later, as both warning and invitation 
Scientific networks at once constitute and represent an image of dispersed power, requiring careful study and analysis to understand their workings. In particular, the networks of science and colonial governance are so tightly overlaid that disentangling the two, however admirable the purpose, decolonizing the field perhaps, poses considerable analytical and not to say practical challenges. My talk today looks at the constitution of archaeology as two things. First, a discourse and set of practices rooted in, though not limited to, field work. And second, a colonial field in which practices of domination and appropriation coexist, often uncomfortably, with a set of higher ideals broadly characterized as scientific. It is productive, I think, to consider field in the broad sense that has made it one of the key words of Pierre Bourdieu's critical sociology. Bourdieu sees the field as constituted by relationships among agents with positions structurally determined by their locations within a larger field. Think of a Venn diagram in which a circle representing society encloses smaller ones representing different sciences. And if this sounds, well, circular, that is how Bourdieu intends it. The agents, he writes, isolated scientists, teams or laboratories, create through their relationships the very space that determines them. The structural determinants consist of differing amounts of capital, another key word in the Bourdieu lexicon, that set the agent's initial positions, although they do not fully determine their relationships. In this schema, a discipline amounts to a particular kind of field in which the capital that establishes positions is largely symbolic, a set of properties discernible to those trained to perceive them. Every field involves struggles for power, typically between dominant agents and newcomers. In addition, as Bourdieu observes, quote, the boundaries of the field are almost always at stake in struggles within the field, unquote. For Latour, the term capital designates what actors or agents accumulate in what he calls centers of calculation, the nodes and knots of scientific networks. Centers of calculation draw together objects, knowledges, and inscriptions, which for Latour betoken not simply the actual inscriptions sought and recorded by epigraphists like Kanya, but any depiction or description of a phenomenon committed to paper, sent via a network's radiating lines. That transmission or movement in fact creates centers of calculation as the network's nodal points. It forms part of, quote, a cycle of accumulation that allows a point to become a center by acting at a distance on many other points." Unquote. If the pertinence of these concepts to the study of colonial situations is clear, historians of science differ on their usefulness. James Secord recognizes their importance while considering Latour overly ahistorical. Simon Schaffer demonstrates their utility by applying notions of locality to specific situations of colonial contact. As Schaffer observes, quote, by attending to science's geographies, the pattern science becomes fieldwork, unquote. This patterning offers a model for using Bourdieu's and Latour's concepts to chart a path through the colonial networks that con constituted early French archaeology as a scientific field. The emergence of heritage institutions and practices in Tunisia has attracted the interest of a number of scholars since 2000. In the interest of time, I simply appoint, point to a few of them here. Notably, an important recent exhibition in Tunis, Les Vées d'une Nation, l'art à l'aube d'une Tunisie moderne, which forms only one part of Rita Mooney's research on archaeology, collecting, and museum projects just prior to the installation of the Protectorate. Miriam Bachas is the more substantial of the two recent free French PhDs on the subject but neither has looked closely at the problem that interests me here, the mutual constitution of archeology span as colonial field and as scientific network. Just as Kanya's missions, he undertook three additional ones of varying length between 1882 and 1888, can be regarded as prefiguring French archeological efforts in the protectorate. The areas of concern he outlined in both his reports and his actions proved remarkably durable. All of these areas, it is worth noting, involved activities temporally distinct from actual excavation, preservation, 
scholarly publication, and what might be called social relations. First, preservation. Cagnat's official dossier in the Archive Nationale de France includes an October 1881 newspaper clipping on the French military's imminent occupation of the holy city of Carawan. The article calls for a group of scholars to join the troops along the lines of the scientific delegation that famously accompanied Napoleon on his expedition to Egypt in 1798, 1799, because of course that went so well. While the author, Marius Vachon, anticipated that French scholars would take possession of artistic treasures in Carawan, he warned that the French army must at all costs avoid, avoid the, quote, shameful <coughs> pillaging, unquote, of the summer palace in Beijing. From his first visit to Tunisia, Kanya was preoccupied with the disposition of the objects he had found. While inclined to send the most important to France, he did so only in consultation with the protectorate administration and assiduously followed instructions to deposit materials with local authorities in anticipation of the opening of an archeological museum in the Bardo. In deciding where to work, Kanya followed the prescriptions of his mentors and correspondents in the metropole who wanted him to go beyond already excavated sites to new terrain, particularly of known Punic, that, that is pre-Roman cities. Kanya readily accepted such instructions because they promised to help secure his own scholarly reputation. And for this, timing was crucial. Writing to request off-prints of a forthcoming report in the scholarly mission's own journal, he observed, quote, as the documents I'm publishing there will be available to all, I have considerable interest in making them known as soon as possible so as to stake my own prior claim." Unquote. Finally, in an uncertain political and military situation, discretion and the observance of proprieties became the precondition for success in the scholarly realm. To this end, Cagnat sought the advice of a French priest, Alfred de Latre, who had since 1875 been excavating in Carthage on land belonging to the Catholic Church. He also requested authorization from religious authorities before entering mosques, and he praised the army officers accompanying him in 1883 as, quote, serious men seeking something other than publicity. Kanya arguably owed his subsequent career not only to his actual excavations, but to his reputation as a similarly serious man with a sense of mission beyond mere publicity. By the first decade of the 20th century, he controlled all the levers of power in the world of archaeology, holder of a prestigious chair in epigraphy at the Collège de France, member and from 1916 till his death in 1937, perpetual secretary of the Académie des Inscriptions, and secretary of the North Africa Commission of the Comité des Travaux Scientifiques et Artistiques, which controlled research funding within the Ministry of Education. More generally, for our purposes here, Kanya's missions show that even at the very beginning of organized state-supported archaeology there, field work in Tunisia was always connected to the constitution of archaeology as a field or discipline in the broader sense elaborated by Bourdieu. And the field always existed as part of a larger colonial apparatus. The Tunisian Antiquity Service, the Direction des Antiquités et des Arts, was set up in 1885. In 1896, it became an autonomous directorate under the authority of a single administrator within the protectorate government. The first three directors of the service, Paul Gauclair, Alfred Merlin, and Louis Poinceau, shared certain key credentials, including a degree in epigraphy or a related field from a prestigious Paris institution, and a stint at the École Française de Rome, which along with its counterpart in Athens served effectively as a training ground for budding French archeologists. Merlin had the most illustrious career of the three. After leaving Tunisia at the end of 1919, he spent a year teaching in Lille before taking up a curatorial position at the Louvre. He was elected to the Académie des Inscriptions in 1928 and eventually became its perpetual secretary in this as in other respects following in the footsteps of Cagnat who was his father-in-law. Poinceau, just three years younger than Merlin, began excavating at Duga in 1899 and served as Merlin's deputy for over a decade before succeeding him in 1920. Merlin and Poinceau had known each other, from, uh, had known each other since their days at the Lycée Louis Le Grand in Paris, and the hundreds of letters from Merlin to Poinceau, available since the 2014 opening 
of the Poinceau family papers <coughs> at the uh, Institut National de l'Histoire de l'Art in Paris are written in an intimate second person singular with frequent inquiries and observations about personal and family health and other such matters. The Poinceau papers, which encompass other partial archives, including correspondence of and related to Gauclair, provide an extraordinary comp complement to existing official archives. Time does not permit me to expand on the richness and complexity of this archive, but I do want to make two points about it. First, the correspondence between Poinceau and Gauclair, between Poinceau and Merlin in the years they worked together, and between uh, Poinceau and his deputy, Raymond Lantier, from 1920 to 25, flows in rhythms governed by the structure of colonial authority, which required someone from the metropole to supervise ind indigenous workers at all times. Uh, and when I say the structures, I mean informal. Uh, uh, this is not written down anywhere, but it's very clear. <coughs> During the field season, letters move between Tunis and the excavation uh, and the excavations that either the director or his deputy, who had the title of inspector, was supervising. They pulsate with the activity of the dig, its ups and downs, challenges and discoveries. Merlin and Poinceau took turns supervising the work at Madia from 1907 to 1913. One of the first major underwater excavations, it brought to light significant works of art and architectural elements from a Greek vessel that foundered off the coast of Tunisia in the first century BCE. Their letters from the coast combine in almost equal measure excitement at the treasures being discovered and concern over unfamiliar practical constraints, constraints involving primitive equipment and trained Greek dry divers who were paid by the minute. It is hard to imagine correspondence more fully embodying and illuminating Secord's idea of science as, quote, a form of communicative action, unquote. Letters also moved between the director and his deputy during vacation periods, which cumulatively and a bit improbably, unless you know France, extended from late July, June or early July into late October, but were staggered so that one or the other was always on post in Tunis. Here the relationship to colonialism and scientific networks is slightly different, but equally apparent. Holiday letters from France hum with the bustle of networking as the archaeologists made the rounds of the academy, museums, libraries, and bookstores before heading to their country retreats, while back in Tunisia, the writer complained of the heat and hoped to have nothing dramatic to report. The letter writers, while clearly aligned with the Metropolitan Center, are thus, and this is my second point, not completely of one or the other world and do not fully adopt center periphery models in navigating between them. They thus like the indigenous people they employ and work with, operate more as cultural translators or intermediaries of the sort whose importance Kalpil Raj has recently demonstrated. The gap between seriousness and publicity to which Kanya referred, clearly privileged in a matter described by Bourdieu, the scholarly elite whose organs could ensure that claims to priority, like Kanya's, would not be confused with shameless self-promotion. The question of publicity and priority runs through the career, throughout the career of another figure granted official archaeological missions in the early years of the Protectorate, a military doctor and archaeologist by avocation named Louis Carton. Just a decade into the new colonial regime, Digging at a defined locale, Duga, the Roman Thuga, with strata extending from the pre-Punic to the Roman periods, rather than surveying potential sites, Carton's concerns already differed markedly from those of Kenya. In his initial request for a formal grant from the French government, Carton argued that establishing Duga as a formal archaeological site would promote tourism, an important part of his vision for the colony. Such a use would also, in his terms, protect the site from the imminent threat of depredation by its contemporary inhabitants and by colonial development. The receptivity to his proposal in Paris stemmed from more pragmatic considerations. The ministry anticipated supporting Carton's petition for leave from his military duties and providing him with a subvention to support his work while delegating to the nominally autonomous Tunisian government, 
the purchase from its own revenue stream of the land required for the dig. In this way, Carton's excavation would provide a testing ground for the mechanisms of protectorate administration, although officials stressed that local authorities would have to be consulted on measures to protect the site. Apart from, indeed, long before interpretive questions about past achievements and conquest, archaeology's sensitivity within the colonial theater comes from the inescapable fact that it entails physical, not just scientific, possession of land. Subsequent correspondence between a frustrated Carton, the Ministry of Education, the Foreign Ministry, and the Office of the French Resident in Tunis conveys something of the complexity and the slowness such arrangements entailed. For Carton, archaeology not only promised to provide evidence of the success of earlier European colonization of Tunisia, but itself offered a kind of model for an imperial project of reclamation and development. His lack of scholarly credentials and dependence on both the government and his military superiors for access to archaeological sites and resources played, placed him at a structural disadvantage in the emerging field, but Carton still aimed for prestige and recognition, publishing his finds when and as he could. In a letter to Gauclair in 1896, he thanked him for constructive criticism of a published article, complaining that too often his work was simply dismissed. Wherever he was posted in Tunisia, from Sousse to Tunis, Carton founded archaeological societies, often with their own publications. For a decade beginning in 1903, Carton published an annual Chronicle of North African Archaeology uh, in the organ of one of those societies. In his self-appointed role as chronicler, Carton praised his fellow amateurs as, quote, modest savants, whose disinterest, devotion, and love of knowledge is neither a promotion nor social climbing." Unquote. Carton really had no choice but to celebrate amateurs. His official archaeological mission had ended in 1899 when the ministry turned down his application for renewal on the grounds that all its resources would henceforth be directed to digs sponsored by the Protectorate Antiquity Service. His attempts to promote his own vision inevitably led him into conflict both personal and archaeology, with the people actually entrusted with authority over French colonial archaeology. All three of the first directors of the Tunisian Antiquity Service had difficult relations with Carton. Merlin, the most affable and emollient of the three, got along best with him, but his correspondence with Poinceau shows that he did not trust him. By 1911, Merlin could dismiss his typical of Carton an article in a Paris newspaper calling for more intensive efforts to excavate at Carthage and preserve the site from development. But Carton was not simply a publicity monger. He could also marshal his rhetorical skills in intimate settings. Merlin recounted to Poinceau how he granted Carton an excavation, an excavation permit only on the, the insistence of an eminent academician who had been moved in a private meeting by Carton's tearful ap appeal for support of Carthage. The mutual antipathy reached new heights when Poinceau became director in 1920, at more or less the same time that Carton, by now retired from the military and a full-time resident of a Tunis suburb, relaunched his campaign in North Africa, in North Africa and the Metropole to remedy what he considered the antiquity service scandalous neglect of Carthage. In Gauclair's case, Basha sees the controversy as simply a quarrel of egotistical men seeking to affirm their authority over a prestigious, if highly contentious, field. And she is not wrong. But something more than personal interest was at stake, and that's why I'm uh, putting this at the heart of my talk. Nothing less than the definition of the archaeological field and its manifestation in the colonial sphere. If Carton's original lament about the neglect and vandalism of Carthage focused on what he called modern vandals, as the years went by, his criticism increasingly targeted French officials, notably after 1920 Poinceau, the head of an arts and antiquity service he criticized for its inaction and lack of initiative. With his own powerful backers in the metropole, Carton carried out a multi-pronged campaign that began after, before the war and reached a crescendo in the 1920s. Numerous articles in the press, from local newspapers to l'illustration, the founding of several associations dedicated to saving Carthage, including one, uh, a ladies' committee presided over by his wife, 
and collaboration with the Touring Club de France and several publishers to produce information panels and guidebooks. The guidebooks invariably included polemical prefaces, at least, commenting on the deplorable lack of care and decline of the site. In December 1922, Carton delivered a lecture in Paris with the title To Save Carthage, <coughs> with apparently the late addition of Louis Bertrand to the program. One imagines that the content of this lecture was quite similar to that of a pamphlet promoting the Ladies' Committee that Carton had published earlier that year. The pamphlet offered a justification for devoting resources to excavating and preserving the site at a time when, quote, there are so many other ruins to raise, unquote. Carton noted that the cost would be minor in comparison, but he also compared the site to pleasures like sports, the cinema, or dessert, of which his listeners would not deprive themselves even while supporting worthy charities. Even more revealing is the way Carton casts himself as a, so a sort of seer, saying that on many occasions, even skeptical visitors who believe nothing to be left at Carthage, quote, after a three hours walk with me and looking at the ruins with other eyes, they have already changed their minds and proclaimed their enthusiasm. I think after a three hours walk with him, you would say practically anything. With few exceptions, however, Carton's backers comprised mostly politicians and literary celebrities such as Bertrand. His was not a scientific network, which, uh, which makes archaeologists' defensive response to him all the more telling. In 1924, Carton finally achieved one of his longstanding goals. The foreign ministry commissioned an independent inquiry into archaeology at Carthage. Poinceau took this inquiry, which threatened his jurisdiction over the site, as both a professional and a personal affront, an attempt by his adversaries to undermine his position. He had reason to be suspicious. For several years, Merlin had been writing Poinceau from Paris about Carton's maneuvers to have himself named director of excavations at Carthage <laughs> with his own budget and full autonomy from the Tunisian Antiquity Service. But the mission did not take the exact form that Carton's supporters had proposed, that is a commission of three members of the Académie des Inscriptions. Cagna, having discreetly used his considerable influence as perpetual secretary to quash this idea, the inquiry was in the end entrusted to one well-known member of the Academy, the classicist Stéphane Zell. As a former director of the Musée des Antiquités Algériennes, Zell had a general familiarity with the situation of archaeology in North Africa, but he had never lived or excavated in Tunisia. On the Ministerial North African Committee, however, he had shown himself open to Carton's proposals, which had forced Merlin to refute them with more firmness than came naturally to him. Poinceau thus greeted Gzell with something less than collegial warmth. Responding to a letter informing him of Gzell's impending arrival, the director wrote, quote, far from being able to do anything useful here, your coming will make an already deplorable situation even more difficult, unquote. This is bureaucraties for basically FU. Zell's report, unsurprisingly, put Carton and Poinceau on the same level, calling them, quote, two archaeologists who are furiously overexcited and, to put it plainly, unbearable. Quote. While recommending that Carton be granted authorization to excavate at Carthage, he dismissed the criticisms leveled at Poinceau and did not endorse the idea of an autonomous excavation director. Even as Zell criticized the antiquity service's efforts at Carthage as far too limited, moreover, he recognized that they had inherited an untenable situation from their predecessors who had failed to acquire land at the site at the beginning of the protectorate when it was still affordable. Although the plans of Cardinal La Vicherie, Archbishop of Carthage in Algiers, to construct a new town on church-acquired land in Carthage were never realized, as a seaside suburb, Carthage was the object of intense real estate speculation beginning in the 1890s, and the arrival of a streetcar from, uh, line from Tunis in 1907 marked its effective incorporation into the larger conurbation. Ultimately, the high cost of real estate made the acquisition of land for excavations prohibited. Tunisia was full of sites of interest to archaeology, and with limited resources, the success successive directors of antiquities made practical decisions to excavate where they could afford to. Carton was certainly aware of the practical issues. 
but for him, the symbolic importance of Carthage justified whatever expense comprehensive excavation and restoration might entail. But if Carthage unleashed the most heated and public phase of the quarrel between Carton and Poinceau, their antagonism had other causes and deeper stakes. Carton accused Poinceau, for example, of having covered over or removed labels in the Bardot Museum, identifying him, that is Carton, as the donor of certain antiquities. The complaint might seem as trivial as the ostensible action. Why, apart from personal pettiness, would Poinceau have done such a thing? Here may we, we may look to the Signal 1920 decree pro uh, protecting archaeological heritage in Tunisia, of which Merlin identified Poinceau, then his deputy, as the primary author. 20 years before the equivalent regulations in the metropole, the decree in nine chapters and 77 articles <coughs> declared all artifacts dating from before the Arab conquests found or yet to be discovered the property of the state. It also banned any trade in antiquities not declared to the government and made the director the absolute arbiter of excavation permits. Carton was known to have a large collection of antiquities and was even rumored to have obtained some he did not himself excavate by passing himself off as an official of the protectorate government. Even if it, most of his acquisitions predated the 1920 decree, which was not retroactive, they violated regulations dating back to 1886. For Poinceau then, Carton was no more the donor of the objects in the Bardo than he was the Pope. And the doctor's collecting practices as much as his ideology account for Poinceau's unusually pronounced personal distaste for him. That Carton was even willing to have himself depicted surrounded by his collection, an image his will widow described as very true to life, must have shocked Poinceau deeply. In his 1924 report on Carthage, Zell touched on Carton's collection, a matter Poinceau had obviously brought up, and acknowledged that, quote, Dr. Carton could not be the legal owner of the objects he found even before 1920, quote. But Zell minimized the value of the objects in Carton's collection and noted that, quote, these misguided ways, however regrettable, have for quite some time been current practice in Africa, unquote and though well known in Carton's case, had not kept the doctor from receiving official subventions for his excavations. Poinceau, however, conscious of the duty of a department head to set a good example, was not inclined to make exceptions. As one of his defenders wrote of Poinceau in the midst of another tangentially related controversy after Carton's death, quote, in truth, this affable man, who is moreover a highly intelligent man, is a lot more than a grumpy bureaucrat. His position as director of antiquities sometimes requires him to put a stop to the machinations of a bunch of profiteers for whom archaeology is only a pretext, and he is obliged to defend himself against their attacks." Unquote. What, though, accounts for the differences between Gzell and Poinceau, particularly on the question of strictly enforcing the heritage code? We might be tempted to attribute this gap to the different locations of the two men within colonial scientific networks, Zell speaking from the lofty vantage point of the imperial center of calculation, Poinceau preoccupied with conditions in the field. A draft letter from Poinceau de Cagnat thanking him for news of his election as an associate member of the Academy of Inscriptions in 1934 is framed in uncharacteristically humble terms. Clearly, he recognized that his own reputation was bound up with his performance as colonial functionary. Poinceau's general attitude may also have been some of the distrust, even contempt, Latour describes as characteristic of scientists in the field toward those whose work takes place only on paper. Yet one could also argue that Poinceau had the more expansive, expansive sense of archaeology as colonial science, in which the comprehensiveness of the data predefines the terrain of calculation. As science first, Latour stresses the vital role of scientists within networks who, quote, make traces of all sorts circulate better by increasing their mobility, their speed, their reliability, their ability to combine with one another, unquote. In this regard, the creation of massive inventories and catalogs, such as the multi-volume catalog of North African archaeological collections commissioned by the government, played a role as important as the collections themselves and arguably greater 
since the setter's position of dominance depends on its capacity to absorb information in a form abstracted from the physical objects or phenomena it describes. But in archaeology, contrary to so-called universal sciences based on replicable experiments, the pertinence of the objects does not disappear once they have been tabulated and recorded. Hence the importance of defined channels of acquisition and storage, all under the control of a dispassionate authority acting in the public, not private interest. Exercising authority in the realm of archaeology involves three steps. First, defining according to criteria usually extrinsic to the society in which it takes place, a domain worthy of protection. Second, establishing a legal and administrative regime that exerts control over objects within this domain. And third, surmounting the opposition that such regimes invariably provoke. The value to imperial rule of enforced regulations in archaeology a domain involving physical disruption of the colonized terrain lies precisely in the appearance of impartiality and legality that authorities seek to project. But what do the actors or agents think about these matters? Poinceau's correspondents, notably Merlin and Raymond Lantier, habitually employ a distinction that many of us will find familiar between the minutiae of their administrative routine often characterized as besogne, or drudgery, and the real work of archaeology. Despite bodily discomforts, labor disputes, and other problems of which they routinely complain, they never sound as happy as when they are in, or more precisely adjacent, to the field. Among the activities they regarded as necessary, they lent themselves with fairly good grace to those demanded by scientific networks and offering real rewards, such as preparing oral reports to the academy or meetings of committees with grant-making authority. For Bourdieu, most rewards within the scientific field come in the intangible form of reputation, but the directors also had to worry about funding and staffing their basic operations as well as ongoing ex excavations. Arguably, the prof professionalization that archaeologists sought as a means of legitimating their authority took place as much on, at the margins as on the front lines in such time-consuming activities as negotiating budgets, escorting visiting dignitaries to excavations, obtaining medals for support staff, and endless meetings. Poinceau's frustrations, frustration with these tasks spilled over into a long-running dispute with his immediate superior, superior, the director of public instruction, whom he regarded as a brainless mediocrity. His colleagues generally contented themselves with complaints in private letters. In other words, the emergent ecology of practices of archaeology, to use a term with some theoretical currency, included not only field and museum practices, such as site photography, stratigraphic analysis, and cataloging, but those bureaucratic procedures that made the rest possible. The distinction between the two and the strong preference for field work over the rest itself became a characteristic of the archaeological habitus. Bourdieu's term for an informal system of perception inculcated alongside formal training. The distinctions archaeologists made between work and drudgery should not be taken at face value. Recalling the seasonal patterns of correspondence I discussed earlier, Latour observes that what we call information is a compromise between presence and absence. Most striking, however, and most de decisive in the entanglement to which I referred at the beginning is the melding over and above such distinctions of scientific and colonial authority. Part of Cagnas and after he returned to the Metropole, Merlin's credibility as defenders of Poinceau came from their familiarity with the exercise of imperial power circumscribed as it invariably was. Their inclination to defend him though came from the habitus of archeological authority they shared shot through with the conviction that their true authority came from their scientific vocation and the ability to balance it with the demands of a government position. This complex and delicate concatenation of authority distinguished them from Carton, who in the 1920s after his retirement had no public responsibilities, and also distinguished them from their administrative superiors, who in their view were not true men of science. Bourdieu usefully observes that the term professionalization oversimplifies the complex process by which disciplines establish demarcating institutions, interest groups, and means of communication 
like this conference. In a related point, Latour notes that the extension of science is in some ways illusory. That's the Maysene uh, that I cited earlier. One of the purposes of scientific networks is to convey a false sense of omnipresence. <clears throat> For scientists travel within, uh, quote, scientists travel within narrow and fragile networks resembling the galleries termites build to link their nests to their feeding sites, unquote. Bourdieu makes a different point about the fragility of science. Because its autonomy, its autonomy is never total, he writes, quote, the field is the site of two kinds of scientific capital, one strictly scientific, the other what he calls, quote, the bureaucratic principle of temporal powers over science, unquote. The directors of antiquities and protectorate Tunisia regarded the latter power as simply a means to a scientific end, that of understanding the past through its systematically discovered material remains, and thus one that could find proper employ only in the hands of people like them. A conscientious regard for what was framed as the public interest counted on this view for more than sometimes messy practice. The distastefulness of this precarious equilibrium perhaps explains the indulgence of Poinsot's supporters for his most intemperate displays. <coughs> in Carton and his defenders, they saw science becoming a means to an end in which the colonial was neither incidental nor simply born, but exalted and enjoyed. The complex legacy of this relationship for archeology span and for heritage fields in general, a legacy you will now proceed to disentangle, lay not only in the exercise, exercise of colonial authority, but also, crucially, in the discretion these scholar managers exercised in wielding it. Thank you very much. Um, there's been a fair amount of scholarship on inter international uh, rivalry and, and competition. Um, and uh, certainly, um, you were discreet enough not to say this, so I, I, I will. The, the French were always um, uh, a few steps behind the Germans. Um, but uh, the, um, they did have the advantage, uh, as of 1912, when the protectorate was established in Morocco, of um, controlling the terrain um, uh, across North Africa, um, uh, uh, that is uh, west of the, the Libyan border. Uh, and um, my sense is that the excavation, that excavation in Libya, which is of course um, equally fascinating uh, and e equally rich in archeological sites, uh, started a little later uh, under, the, under the aegis of the British. But yes, uh, and, and this is certainly um, one of the things that the, um, that, that's implicit in the, um, the, the, the establishment of the field. The, and if I, one of the parts of this talk that I cut was uh, talking a little bit more about scholarly journals and their importance uh, as a form of communication. Um, but certainly the, and, and the Americans who also make only you know, very brief appearance are a very important part of the story and to that, that those uh, um, American excavations. I, I mean, I, I agree with you and I, I chose to concentrate on the macro level, the, the micro level, because I think that's um, a part of the story that has been uh, neglected. Um, but I, uh, the, the military, uh, I mean, I, I did mention um, the officers accompanying Kanya, um, I did mention the military situation. Um, the, mil the military uh, is very important uh, in the early stages of uh, the protectorate, uh, as it had been in Algeria, something that um, uh, Bonnie Efros has discussed very thoroughly in, in, in in, uh, in her research in, in a book that's coming out later this year. Um, it's less important uh, as, and it's, it's, I think it's less important, part of the, one of the 
uh, points of a protectorate form of administration is to um, uh, to to um, lessen the military, uh, the burden on the imperial military by um, uh, leaving intact uh, uh, traditional forms of uh, surveillance and security, which are of course uh, under the under the control of the, um, the the protectorate government, but which are not um, uh, are not they're, they're, they are not legally or uh, effectively um, an occupying force. So uh, it's less important in in Tunisia, and certainly um, less in the period that. That uh, that I'm focusing on, which is the 20s, um, than uh, than it was earlier. 